this issue from, I think, three different angles, which is great. Um, Jeffrey, everybody knows who you are already. You are the godfather of, um, I think, the use of of OSINT in uh, policy and policy support. I'm really happy to have you here to talk about this topic. Um, I'm going to go next to James um, because James comes at this from the Intel community. And so he uses open source, but he combines open source with what is called in the biz um, all source analysis. And so he, I think, will give us a great perspective on how open source is incorporated into intelligence analysis and then it goes to Marina, who is in this case um, serving as our policy representative and she will be able to talk to us, I think, really effectively about um, how open source from both the unclassified world and other information from the intelligence world combines helping make policy. So with that, um, I am going to um, kick it off here and um, just say to begin with that, you know, I think it's fair to say that the Ukraine war um, has really brought open source front and center to many, many people. I mean, we've been in the midst of what I think is an open source revolution for some time, but with the Ukraine war, it's, it's really in everybody's face. And, um, and so I think it's important for us to use that as a context for what's working and what's not. And we can maybe get into some, to some questions about that. And I think about this because, you know, when I was in intelligence, I was getting information, including open source, but it was given to me um, by smart people like James. And, um, and I had an automatic curation mechanism. And now I'm on my own and I'm talking about geopolitics all the time. I'm talking about... Russia-Ukraine war on, on CNN or at conferences, and I have to pull all this information together myself. And I have been amazed when I'm here in the world where I don't have intelligence, how smart I can be, um, I think, uh, at least I try, but how much information is out there for me to grab onto. But at the same time, I miss my colleagues in the intelligence community who helped me validate that, make sense of it, tell me what was important and not, and then and then added that secret information into it. And so it'll be really fun to have this conversation today. So I wanted to start off by, and I'm trying to make this a little bit more concrete, um, instead of talking big picture OSINT, by asking Jeffrey to talk to us a little bit about the case of North Korea. And um, you know how important has open source been since the UN inspectors were kicked out in 2009? And, and then, you know, have you had any feelings of, of gaps or, you know, how it, how it hasn't worked? Well, I mean, looking at North Korea is all gaps. I mean, it's <laughs> in, right. an incredibly uh, difficult place. When I, think, when I think about the value of open source information, uh, I think of it as being a, a very distinct way of knowing. Uh, uh, when I, you know, one of my colleagues uh, at CNS, who recently, recently retired, Sandy Spector, you know, spent many years at the Carnegie Endowment, wrote these incredible books about nonproliferation in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, and they are remarkable, and they are based entirely on things he could get people to tell him. Because he really did not have, and no one had, an ability to look out and get facts for themselves. Um, and I, I, I couldn't have done it the way Sandy did. Like, I am just not that smart. I don't work that hard. Um, and so now we live in this era where data is ubiquitous. Uh, we have so many commercial satellite images. I have more satellite images of North Korea than I can ever look at in my entire lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you have a country like that where you can't access it, uh, you know, I've met North Koreans on a few occasions, but that's pretty, you know, few and far between. I don't really feel like I get good answers out of them, and I certainly can't roam around the country myself. That ability to take information that comes out, whether it's photographs that are ground truth or satellite images or uh, building computer models of facilities, uh, and then using that data together, I, I think it is literally the only way 
that we have to know about North Korea's sensitive defense programs, given that they don't let anyone in. Yeah. So, James, I'm going to put the intel officer in the uncomfortable spot of talking to an audience. Um, yeah, you're welcome. Thanks. Um, and I wanted to start with you with a bigger picture question about how do you think about open source in the context of all source analysis? How important is it to you? And how do you rack and stack uh, the different incoming pieces of all source analysis? Sure. So uh, I, I'll start off by saying open source information is crucially important to the IC and to our assessments. And you kind of hit on it earlier. Basically, we break it down. Open source, from my perspective, is any kind of information that's not acquired through a classified means. So the more classified sources of information would be things like human intelligence or human, and signals intelligence, SIGINT, uh, also classified uh, imagery, so not necessarily open source imagery stuff. Um, and as an all source intelligence analyst, we, I, I use all of that information in forming uh, my assessments. And I've been in the IC now almost 30 years, worked all kinds of hard target uh, uh, issues, including North Korea, uh, counterterrorism, and now is the NIO for WMD, everything. And I have always used open source information uh, in my assessments. Uh, as an analyst, what you do is you look for, you look at all information. Like I, I'm an information, uh, you know, consumer. I wanted as much information as I could possibly get. The more information, the better. Although I'll caveat that by saying I, I want good information. I don't, I don't want bad information, and that's a challenge uh, with with everything uh, and so as an analyst when I'm when I'm looking to answer a specific intelligence question or if I'm in kind of more of a monitoring role or just kind of looking at developments I'll, I'll look at all forms of information and what I'm looking for is the best information and I literally do not care where that information comes from uh, only well I do care but only in the context of establishing whether or not it's good information so if I'm right if somebody says Murph write an assessment on North Korea uh, I will look at all information, and if the best information that I have available to me is open source information, I will use that, figure, uh, use it prominently in my assessment, and write that paper. Uh, now, typically, the kinds of questions that I get asked as an intelligence analyst are not the kind of questions that we can answer just by looking at open source information. So we use those classified sources of, of information, but the open source information is really cr uh, crucial. Uh, and in fact, uh, Open source information, historically, I think, uh, most analysts use open source information for what I consider kind of context and background. So I can't understand what I'm seeing through classified uh, reporting on a country or a terrorist group if I don't have access to open source information that puts it all in perspective. Uh, and so that's kind of traditionally how we've used it. And so things like newspapers, uh, you know, I, I would say that my day starts off the same way a lot of you start off your days. I open the paper, I read the paper. Uh, and we don't just read uh, U.S. papers, we'll read foreign language papers, we'll read journals, we'll read academic publications, uh, because all there's a, just a ton of information that's out there, and that helps us do our jobs. And then we incorporate that, kind of, that provides the, con the context and the, the background information that we need to make sense of the, uh, the, the information that we're seeing from more classified sources. What do you think is the difference, the delta now? I mean, open source is a lot more than newspapers, right? It's, Absolutely. You know, there's so much commercial imagery that's out there. Um, there's so much, uh, you know, maybe not as much with North Korea, but certainly we're seeing in the Ukraine war and other contexts that we're, we're having social media. Um, GPS is playing a big role in geolocation. And, um, you know, there's a lot of things going on. What do you think for you is kind of the delta between what you can get in that open source world and what you rely on on the classified world in terms of answering that those questions? Um, 
you know? Yeah, so I, I would say that Delta is shrinking in a lot of cases uh, because of so much information. Uh, well, when we say there's a lot of information out there, I think what we're actually saying is there's a lot of sources of that information that's then getting published online or, mm-hmm. or through social media or something. So it's all kind of, it's out there and it's available. Uh, and so because I guess the collection scope of open source is increasing, the things that state and not state actors can hide from us is also decreasing because there's just so much that everyone's got a camera, everyone's uh, got access to Twitter and they can post it on there. Uh, and so that does decrease the Delta. Uh, and that's a good thing and a hard thing. It's, it's, a, it's a hard thing sometimes because there's just so much open source information out there mm-hmm. and we have to be able to figure out, we have to be able to find it and then we have to be able to figure out what's good and what's bad. Uh, but the good thing is, as that delta uh, decreases, we can shift our collection of resources to other areas that maybe open source isn't well positioned to collect on. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's a, a benefit to us because if we can acquire something through open sources, we're not going to spend a lot of time focusing classified collection sources on that because that's just a waste of resources. Yeah. I'm going to turn to Marina in just a second, but I'm going to ask Jeffrey, are you ever jealous? of what James has and you don't. <laughs> Good Lord, no. I do. See, I, I kind of knew the answer to that before I asked, and I want to ask why that is. So look, nicer toys are better, and I appreciate that. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think this is fundamentally uh, an analytic problem. Right? So there's this saying in horse racing that you bet the jockey, not the horse. And it's better if your horse is faster, and you, you got a faster horse, and that's <laughs> awesome. But, you know, we are really focused on uh, the idea of analytic quality and, and being resourceful and working with what we have. Uh, and so, you know, to me, that is a, that's a challenge that's very appealing um, and, and adds a certain richness um, because you know sometimes we really have to work at it uh, and I, I often I have an example that I use in the class I teach which is there is a, a declassified national intelligence estimate uh, from just after the Soviet Union had cut off assistance to the Chinese nuclear program and in that NIE which you know reflects the best classified information they had access to at the time they don't actually know that the assistance had started let alone that it had stopped and there is simultaneously an article uh, written by a guy named George Ginsburg. And all he did, now he was a, he was a special kind of person because he, he spoke Russian and Chinese. And so he just read um, communist block newspapers and he knew how to read them. Right? He understood what that propaganda indicated. And he, he did better than the NIE. You know? And so that is a case where someone who was admittedly like a very special analyst think much more than i would ever be uh, was able to get so much information out of so little Um, and so well look there are definitely days where i'm like "Ooh, i wish i had a better radar picture of this place for sure Um, i don't feel fundamentally like our problem is that we don't have enough data that our problem still remains fundamentally one of uh, analytic approaches uh, and thinking about problems clearly. And solving that is is thing you solve with better method, more so than better data. So we're going to come back to that, but I want to, because I think this idea of creating better jockeys is a really important one. But I'm going to turn it over to Marina now and ask, as a recipient of all of this information, and you have the problem too, if you have so much coming in from think tanks and smart people, labs, uh, where you used to work, um, and the Intel community and policy colleagues, how do you sort through the idea of the importance of open source for you? And do you think that the policy communities in, in this space of nuclear policy, arms control policy, do you think we're, that we are where we should be? Mm, yeah, thank you so much, Beth. And thank you to Carnegie for having me back. Um, it's really great to see so many um, colleagues. You know, I come at this from the arms control policy making perspective. Um, I currently work in the Bureau of Arms Control Verification and Compliance. 
um, where we're responsible for bilateral negotiations and implementation of arms control agreements, as well as all of our multilateral engagements. Um, so as it relates to how open source affects the day-to-day -day of our work, um, you can take, for example, New Start implementation. Uh, for example, you know, when we're trying to monitor compliance to that agreement, um, we use national technical means in addition to information exchanges with our Russian counterparts as well as on-site inspection. Those have been the primary information streams by which we make formal compliance um, judgments. But that's not to say that we don't see a value um, in open source information in the way that we think about our work and also the way that we conduct our work. Um, and you said earlier, you know, we've kind of been in this revolution or renaissance or, you know, this kind of maturing field of open source information. And I absolutely agree. And all of these technologies kind of coming together at the same time over the last 10 years, right, with kind of the, the proximity and prevalence of social media, the continued maturation of commercial satellite imagery, all of these things have kind of come to a head. Um, and we've been wrestling as a bureau and I think as, a, as an organization with what the what the role of this information should be in our work. As early as 2011, we were asking, asking these questions. Um, and you can see different government players um, wrestling with this and starting to bring these tools, these commercial tools, um, particularly on the imagery side, into their strategies more formally, right? So you think about organizations that are responsible for a geospatial analysis or what have you, and they have these kind of hybrid architecture visions, right? Where to James's point, you'll be able to leverage um, open source, unclassified information alongside the classified exquisite sources. And that in part gives you the opportunity not only to use the limited bandwidth of your exquisite sources better, but also to think about the further research and development for future systems that you'll, that you'll develop, right? So if there's, to James's point, information that we can get from the unclassified space, then we may not need to devote the R&D to doing that in, in, in the exquisite sense, assuming that the quality, to your point, James uh, or Jeffrey, is, is, is to where we need it to be. Um, so I think, you know, we are, we're, we're open, we're trying to understand, and, and you know, when we tend to talk about open source information, I think we um, immediately go to commercial satellite imagery. There's a lot of different data forms, right? To Jeffrey's point about modeling, about social media. Um, and I think as an organization, we're thinking through how best to use that, not only in the formal judgments that we make on our agreements, but also the way that we do work, right? So you think about, you know, uh, you know certain organizations are able to text in the midst of meetings. Right. Yeah. That can Not help. Tech, but no. Right. Yeah. That can help in relationship building and kind of uh, accelerating negotiation. Other organizations, particularly um, you know military uh, alliances and conversations around um, those type of topics. Obviously, you cannot have your phone in that conversation. Right. So it slows things up. So you know, I think there's different levels to this question. Um, but we, as an organization, like many others, are, are, are working to understand. And I think there's to the point about the Delta. I think there was a lot more hesitancy or just unfamiliarity with with how impactful this could be. But the last you know few years, and particularly now, have demonstrated kind of unequivocally that there is value and there is a role. Um, you know, especially from a diplomacy standpoint, right? Being able to share information, um, call out bad action and misbehavior, disinformation, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's hugely important for the work that we do. So. We, you know, we definitely appreciate the role. We're working through kind of the formalities of, of wrapping it into our processes. Yeah, I mean, uh, when you said that about the disinformation, um, you know, I think about uh, the, the run up to the Ukraine war. And, um, you know, certainly there was some open source use there in terms of um, the US government policy, but there was also declassification of information that wasn't available in open source, especially about, um, about uh, you know, the plans to, for the, um, um, you know, blaming Ukraine for, and creating a pretext for war. And that was only available in classified. And, um, and, I, and so again, I think it is like what I'm hearing from you, it's still a fusion that's important to you, um, even though Jeffrey's not jealous. But I don't think you have any reason to be. Um, I have a really good life. And you have some great, <laughs> I know. I was saying, like, and if I could live in Monterey, I mean, really, 
I mean, occasionally people confuse me with James, which we you know, preach. <laughs> yeah. <to>. Oh. <laughs> it's easy. By the way, it's easy to tell the difference. It happens all the time. <laughs> Remember, James is British and odd. <laughs> okay. I won't. I won't go there. I want to remind everybody to ask questions on the app. There are a few coming in here. Have been a few sessions that know that already. So one of the the next things I, wa I wanted to ask um, is about how. Um, open source is now changing with technology um, because you know one of the things that I really think about is um, how we use big data um, we use data sets we use machine learning in order to monitor a lot of different sites at the same time I mean there's a lot of technology now coming into play and I and I kind of wonder um, our practitioners who have been doing this for a while, are we actually ready um, for this change? And how should we think about um, maybe how we need to change our approaches because of this advent of, of technology? And maybe I'll start with you, Jeffrey. <laughs> well, this is actually something that we focus on a lot uh, at the Institute because we train a lot of students uh, some of whom may go on to be intelligence analysts, in which case they get to play with your cool toys. Um, you know, some of them will go on to be policymakers. It, it, you know, uh, not, not as good as you, but you know, <laughs> maybe pretty okay. Uh, and for those people who are going to be policymakers, we always sort of discuss: well, how much detail do you give people? Uh, because they may never actually do this kind of work themselves. And I actually think it's very important for policymakers uh, to understand where the data is coming from. Right? So to at least know uh, how information is produced, how it's analyzed. So maybe you'll never interpret a satellite image yourself, but it's important to know how satellite images are interpreted. You know, I often think of the case of the Cuban Missile Crisis where President Kennedy and apparently everyone else in the room were too embarrassed to say that they could not see in the imagery what the analysts could. And that's because there's an art to it, and analysts are really good. Um, but I think moving forward, as new kinds of information becomes available, and as I say, this is a way of knowing, I think having a familiarity with how that data is generated and interpreted is going to be absolutely essential for making the best use of it. I agree completely. I, when I first interviewed for the intelligence community, um, I went down to the predecessor of NGA called NPIC, and they showed me, they had me sit at this light table, and they showed me this image, and they said, you know, like, it was a test for my interview, like, well, what do you see? And I, and I like, saw a baby. Um, I didn't pass the test. <laughs> it is not easy. Um, it looked exactly, you know, like, Yes, anyway. Um, we have I think it's a really, lesson. it's really, <laughs> I'm just, anyway. But I think it's really hard, um, and there's skills involved. And, um, and so one of the things that I think is really important is that I've, I've noticed during the Ukraine war is there are a lot of people out there who are looking at this commercial imagery, and they're, they're commenting on it. And how do you know if that person knows what there's, they're doing or not. I mean, this gets to your point, James, about I don't, there's a lot of information out there, not all of it's good. Um, how important do you think training is um, in developing this, these open source skills? Uh, again, I think it's, it's crucial. Uh, and I think I've, I've heard some of uh, Jeffrey talking about this on some of his blogs and, and posts uh, about teaching people how to do this stuff because you can't just oh okay well I've got access to imagery and a lot of articles now I'm going to figure it out so I started off as an imagery analyst at CIA and one of the things that's not that, see a baby what, no I, I don't <laughs> so I don't know how you can look at a light table and see a baby so <laughs> I, I am fascinated but one of the things that uh, I didn't actually see a baby but I did not see the missile site <laughs> one of the things that always drives me crazy when I see people post imagery is when they post it the wrong way oh I am with you make so, a there's a way to orient the image so that it, it makes visual sense See, and it drives me nuts. They're trained. They put it on upside down, it drives me nuts. Yes, it's important. But yeah, I mean, if you put a piece of imagery <laughs> upside down in a paper and then publish it, you've already lost credibility with everybody who knows 
that you have to <laughs> orient the imagery so that you can make sense of it. Uh, and that's just basic tradecraft, right? right? You have to right. have tradecraft. You have to be able, you have to know uh, the basic concepts of, of, uh, uh, of you know, your trade. I guess that's what they call yeah. it, tradecraft. Yeah. Uh, and every IC agency does that. Every IC agency teaches its analysts how to do their stuff. So I actually started off in my career as a SIG, uh, as a SIGINT analyst in the Army. So the Army trained me how to interpret the things that I was, you know, get, you know, I was get, I wasn't actually listening. I was looking at transcripts. But they taught me how to interpret that and how to make sense of that. When I went to uh, NEMA, which was after NPIC and before NGA. They taught me how to look at imagery and how to uh, make those kinds of conclusions. And then going to CIA, they taught me how to do all sorts uh, assessments. Uh, and it's not terribly complicated. Uh, I mean, we, we put a lot of effort into training analysts, but it's a lot of the same kinds of things that you're going to learn in graduate school. Uh, it's teaching you how to think. It's teaching you how to think critically. It's teaching you how to, uh, I, I like to call it, interrogate your sources so that you understand everything about the source or as much as you can understand about the source of information that you're taking and then, and then using it. And those same tradecraft skills that I learned as an all source analyst that are applied mostly to classified collection apply to open source as well. Uh, you can't just look at an article or a social, especially a social media post and take it at face value. You have to interrogate the source. You have to think, what is this? Who is the person who posted this? What are they posting on? Do Are they in a position to actually know what they're talking about? Uh, if they're passing rumors, that could be fine too. But then it's like, OK, who's the ultimate source of that rumor? Does that person, is that person in a position to know what they're talking about? And you, as, a, as an experienced intelligence officer, you learn those things. Jeffrey, you've you've kind of learned in your cohort. I've had to learn that too, and I I like have to ask friends. It's like, oh, is this person good? Is that person good? You know, how do we think about that? Marina, as a policymaker, are are you? What are your views yeah, on all of this? Yeah, I have a little different. I, I really appreciate the training question, and I come at this again not as an intelligence officer, but as someone who focuses on arms control policy. And for me, I think equally as important, particularly when we're talking about monitoring compliance or behaviors under agree agreements um, is everyone needs to have an appreciation of the difference between monitoring and verification, mm -hmm. right? Um, and also an appreciation of the nuance when we're talking about violations, right? Um, so, you know, when we talk about, you know, monitoring is a technical activity, right? You are taking in a measurement, whether it's an image or you're collecting radioactive uh, uh, samples, what have you, right? That is a, a technical activity. Verification is a political activity, right? It's a judgment that you're making based on the data that you have in front of you, right? And I think sometimes um, those two words are used in, um, interchangeably in a way that's not helpful to the conversation. Um, I bring that up because, you know, um, like I said, we do see the value in open source um, analysis, broadly speaking. I think um, when we're talking about activities that one state might be, you know, doing versus another, you know, there's there's this idea of, you know, are we looking for politically significant violations, militarily significant violations? Different states look at this differently, right? So having the open and having the open source community um, develop a, a literacy and a muscle memory with that part of the conversation about, okay, once we've observed something, what are the different interpretations that we can have? What are the different factors weighing into the into that judgment, right? Um, because we've seen from administration to administration things be handled handled um, differently based on their per perspectives and worldview. So I think that's an important part of the conversation that's not always represented. I think that answers um, partly at least Jordan Smith's question about the standards by which you judge the validity of these sources. Jeffrey, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, you know, it's a funny thing. We don't often use the phrase open source in our work. We tend to talk about new tools because our sense is that the research methodologies are the same as they ever have. The institute that I work at started as a language school, and all those old ways of knowing, we think are like not just like legitimate, like we tolerate them, but they are foundational. So it's, it's not that there's this sort of new universe, it's just that there are these new tools, but you are still engaged in the same critical reasoning of interrogating 
uh, sources. And so, I, you know, I often in my in my class, I, if anybody here ends up taking it, I'm, I'm ruining it. But <laughs> when when I first assign something to read, the first question I ask is, okay, who wrote it? Okay, why is this person writing about this? And the number of people who don't pay attention to that is really surprising. Yeah. And I yeah. say, look, reading is not staring at each, each word sequentially. Right? You really have to engage critically with the text. And now we have new tools in the form of commercial satellite images and data. But that fundamental reasoning capability, uh, you know, you could have learned that 300 years ago. I agree completely on that. I mean, I think that that was one of the big lessons out of Iraq WMD and the Intel failure there is that, you know, it was a in large part, it was a failure on sourcing and to really question sourcing and to understand it and to go back again um, and to deal with sourcing in a way. And the result of that was the Intel community really doubled down on critical thinking, as well as technically trying to deal with some of the sourcing issues that were related to the, the operational sourcing. But I, I do think that that critical thinking and the processes and the research methodology, like these are all fundamental. And I think something we all share. I wanted to ask, um, and one of these questions is it's related to one of the questions of the audience here um, about crowdsourcing, um, open source. And Maureen and I were talking a little bit uh, about this before we came on about some of the ideas you have about creatively using open source. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. I think the way I think about it, there's kind of two ways that open source can be immediately helpful or is immediately helpful to the work that we're doing in our office. Um, and part of it, I think I have to, have to kind of give a preamble of the way that when we use the term arms control, we're using it broadly speaking, right? So typically when folks hear the term arms control, they immediately think, legally binding agreements, right? So um, new start, start, things like that. And those are, yes, a part of the equation, but there's also less formal things like risk reduction that we've heard about in the previous sessions, confidence building measures, right? That don't have to be, um, go through Senate approval and ratification, but are nonetheless important to kind of laying um, the, the groundwork for a more stable relationship, right? Um, and for us, particularly in these new domains, right, like space and cyber that don't lend themselves nicely in the way that nuclear did or even conventional does to kind of quantitative limits on systems, what's going to become more important is the idea of, of norms, right? How do we constrain irresponsible behavior? How do we define what we think is irresponsible and inappropriate? And how do we put kind of boundaries, agreed upon boundaries around that? So a, a good example is something that we're actually um, uh, uh, trying to gain support for at the UN First Committee right now around our ASAT resolution, right? So you all might have heard um, the Vice President earlier this year um, announced the US commitment not to conduct direct, direct descent destructive anti-satellite missile tests, right? Um, and we chose that path as a first step towards norm building in space in part because First of all, it was achievable, right? It's a very simple resolution. It is exactly the words I just said, is exactly what we're committing to. Um, and it's in the interests of all parties, right? Industry, government, space debris is no one's friend, right? So for us, it was a natural first step and it is externally verifiable. So you know when a country has launched a missile to destroy a satellite in orbit, right? Like it's not something that's easily hideable um, and to us we saw that as a strength right because it's something that um, will allow for very easily being called out and and here we see um, open source information and analysis as being um, potentially very useful right in terms of not only having the exquisite capabilities to see it on the inside and classified but to be able to see it on the blogs and on twitter that this has happened right because from a diplomatic standpoint, that information then becomes um, kind of the, the, the content that we can use to galvanize the international community, right? To say, listen, we don't appreciate this behavior. You're putting all of our systems at risk. You're putting all of our citizens at risk in terms of their daily life, the way the, the systems that we need to rely on for internet, for comms, for GPS. This is not something that we can accept from a responsible state, right? 
So from that perspective, we see a natural synergy with open source um, in terms of helping to build and externally ver observe these behaviors. But then the second piece to that is kind of in the day-to-day -day work that we do. So a lot of the work that we do in my bureau and in the State Department in general is not just focused on negotiating an agreement, but often around building a common understanding, right? Literally just having conversation so I can understand how you see a problem, right? When you use this word, what exactly do you mean, et cetera, et cetera. And we have initiatives um, that we've been supporting and pushing really hard on that are designed for just that. So for example, the Creating an Environment for Nuclear Disarmament initiative that brings together a really diverse group for informal conversations around risk reduction, around incentives for nuclear use, right? Um, things like IPNDV, the International Panel for Nuclear Disarmament Verification, where we're digging into the details of verification. All of these are forums where you have really um, really unique states together to talk, to understand what you see when you look at an image or when you look at a data point. And some of the activities we do are things like tabletop exercises, right? Where you put, we saw that great panel with Sharon this morning where she put us in a VR experience and tried to simulate a crisis situation, right? So we can do that with a tabletop experiment where it might be text-based, where we're giving folks scenarios, but what if we were able to wrap in real open source data that wasn't kind of manufactured by the folks in the bureau, but was actually something that we could reference from a historical event or what have you. So that's kind of the way that we're thinking through how to incorporate open source imagery, social media data, metadata, what have you, into both the agreements we're trying to negotiate and we're trying to lobby for, and also the day-to-day -day work we do to build common understanding. That's great. Mm -hmm. And do that. <laughs> Me too. Jeffrey, what do you think the pros and cons are of, of kind of, of crowdsourcing open source? Well, crowds are incredibly valuable, um, but they are incredibly valuable in specific ways that we know. So, uh, you know, a crowd is going to a great, do a great job of guessing how much an elephant that we put on stage weighs. You know? And so there are some problems like that that are really amenable. Um, but then there are other areas where crowd wisdom just isn't all that useful. And, and so the natural question is, well, you know, where, where are the contours of that? Where does it cross over from being useful and not useful? And, and we've explored that a little bit. Uh, we had for several years a project called Geo for Non-Pro where we tried, to, we tried to create kind of mini crowds. Uh, you know, as it turns out, the crowd that self-selects to go pin things on, right. a, on a website right. is not exactly a crowd crowd. <laughs> right, right. Um, and, and so, you know, I don't, I don't have any, any really pat answers other than to say that you know, crowds, I think, are really good at estimating things where the kind of information that's being accessed is is generally available. Um, I think crowds are less good than when, when you showed them a building and ask them what's going on in the building. Mm, I agree. Uh, I wanted to turn to kind of the dark side of, of OSIN because I think we, we kind of make this assumption going in that it's all, um, you know, rainbows and unicorns and, and there couldn't be really anything bad about open source. And I, and I, I want to kind of challenge that a little. There have been a couple questions here about um, how actors react to open source, and you know whether it creates um, whether that they will hide things differently, or whether they will, you know, react in some way that is actually undermines U.S. policy interests or something. James, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, sure. Uh, so. Uh, how can I put this? I, I pause a lot when I have to talk to even classify a moment. Uh, so uh, state and non-state actors, uh, I think I mentioned this before, or maybe I didn't, I, I forgot to mention it. Uh, a lot of them have incentives to hide things from us. Uh, and as more and more uh, open source collection tools uh, and means are available and more open source information comes out there, their ability to hide those things goes down but also their ability to understand how their ability to hide things is going down goes up. So they get smarter 
at maybe hiding things that they realized now people can determine through open source. So, and that is the same problem that uh, classified collection uh, means face as well. And that's one of the reasons why uh, we classify an intelligence that we collect from some of our sources, because we understand that if that information gets out, our adversaries will start asking themselves, how did they know that? Uh, and they will go back and figure out, oh, okay, that's probably how they figured it out. And they'll stop doing that, which is bad for us. And so they're trying to do that with open sources as well. The flip side of that argument, though, is that now they know that they can uh, get information out through open sources in particular ways, and they can exploit that as well. Uh, and so they can exploit that f to for disinformation campaigns, for example, or to you know, you know, flash something shiny over here that people will go focus on and tweet about uh, and talk about a lot and distract them from the thing going on over here that they may not be able to hide as well, but that now no one's looking at because they're all distracted over here. And again, that's the same problem we have with what classified intelligence means. All information is information. Uh, whenever we publish uh, in or publish. Free, do you ever worry about when you put out something new, um, like the Chinese nuclear field or any number of things that were kind of for the first time that maybe you or your institute put out there about the capabilities of an adversary? Do you ever think about and how do, how do you sort through in your head um, what the consequences of that are, you know, how do you kind of play with that? Yeah, we really, we really lean into that. So I, I am, I sleep very well at night and I'm, am, am unbothered by these questions. Um, and that's one, why you're here. <laughs> it's true. One reason I'm unbothered is because um, the United States of America has adversaries, but we're academics, so we don't. Uh, we study everyone's programs. Uh, when the U.S. government isn't transparent, we snoop on it just like we snoop on the North Koreans. And so we're really interested just in getting at the truth. Now, it does happen that governments that are less transparent than the United States government, like the North Koreans, do read what we write and they respond by trying to hide things. Uh, that's the funny. You know, for the longest time, they got tired of us geolocating Kim Jong-un and they started putting him in a tank. Uh, and then, you know, my colleague Dave Schmirler kept geolocating Kim, despite the fact that they were only photographing him in this <laughs> tank. And so what I take away from that is there is naturally going to be that cat and mouse game. And, and so I, I, I'm not bothered by the existence of that game. And there's actually a, there's an upside to it because when you are dealing with a country that is making efforts to hide specific information, or when you are dealing with a country that is producing false information, mm -hmm. 
if you can achieve a level of analytic superiority that you are catching them doing those two things, you have now learned far more about them than you had previously because you know not just a thing that they don't want you to know, but you know that they don't want you to know. Or you know what they want you to think um, in, in a way that they would be uncomfortable with. So to me, that's just kind of the nature of this endeavor. Um, and if you are using a lot of different data sources, um, you know, it's sort of easy to spoof one data source. It's hard to spoof three or four. So if you can fuse multiple sources of data, uh, at least in our experience has been, we'll often discover countries being uh, less than honest in the way that they present information. And that discovery will be much more interesting than the actual information itself because it goes to their worldview and their outlook and their plan. One of the questions here is related to this about how AI might make this even harder with the idea of deep fakes or you know, just putting out information that you, know, you, you can make it really hard to figure out that it is um, not correct. And is there anything that's going on, um, before I turn to Marina to talk about the negatives from your perspective, I just want to do the jump ball here on Chantel's question about how, how this sophisticated misinformation using technology um, will impact open source analysis and our understanding. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll just jump in. On the open side, you know, we spend a lot of time uh, and a lot of donor money um, worrying uh, and acquiring the analytic and software tools in order to deal with digitally altered images and videos. Uh, and and that's, a, that's a really intense arms race. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the deep fakes that we see aren't really very good. No, we're exactly. Um, but so far. Yeah, yeah I think they're going to get better. They're getting better, right? And so, so that, is, that is an area that we're, we're aware of and, uh, and we're preparing for it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to know. But what, the one thing I would say, though, is it, to, to go back to that idea of new tools, we are really focused on the fact that it is easy to make digital, uh, digitally altered photographs and videos. I, it was, you, the Soviets did that for a long freaking time. And you know, having looked at how you deal with analog photos and digital photos, I, I think the digital stuff might not be as hard as, <laughs> as some of the, 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 the really high quality analog fakes in the past. So interesting. it's just a problem that we've always had. And, and you know, again, if it didn't exist, where would the fun in it be? Right. <laughs> Can I add something yeah, on that? It's, so it's interesting. I, I totally agree with you, Jeffrey, about this kind of inevitable um, arms race between the technology to spoof data advancing and the technology to try to detect those spoofs advancing and so on and so forth. And to me, what, 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 what that triggered for me was, this is why we need like crisis communication channels and things like this. Like we need, you know, as the technology continues to be um, in question or, or not the technology, but the data, the information that we are looking at, there's you know, increasing questions because the technology is progressing in this way you know, that's why we want to have these channels with our adversaries, with our partners, to be able to, in real time, if you see a video that says that we are going to do X, if I had a conversation with you last week about your doctrine, and that is totally, you know, separate and aside from what I'm seeing in this video, I can call you up and say, it's, okay, so hey, I saw this video, did you see this on Twitter? That, that, that doesn't sound like what you told me last week in the, in the, uh, in the doctrine exchange that we had, right? So this idea of, and this is, I mean, it sounds pretty low level, but this is serious, right? Like we, we are trying to have these conversations with our Chinese counterparts, right? About establishing risk reduction mechanisms, establishing channels of communication, so that in the event that there is a non-state actor that creates a video that is very believable, that is saying something that is, you know, kind of alarming and against what we understand, that we have a way to reach out and say, okay, can you clarify? Or we have that pre-existing understanding because we've done 
these doctrine exchanges or we've done these transparency exercises so that we understand each other's perspectives and the way that we plan to move. So if there is a third party that we can't control that interjects themselves into the conversation, there's a way for us to actually get to the truth. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, that, that to me sounds, it feels like a natural relationship. So as an extension of that, um, Sarah El Said asked this question about how open source, I guess, either legitimate or not legitimate, um, impacts public opinion and even legislative processes. And if you have any comments on that, Marina. So the legislative process is an interesting question. I think, you know, when we were talking about the risk, one of the, the risks of open source, I think one of, one of the things that we have to acknowledge is the fact that um, both the technology and the analytical capability is not uniformly distributed across the globe, right? There are certain players that are well represented in the conversation and others that are not. And part of it is a resource question. Part of it, I think, is a political systems question, right? How free is a society to engage in this type of open source analysis? Does the government see it as harmless questions that are being asked by academics? Or is this espionage, right? So like, these are constraints on the way that this field is being developed and where we see the voices and where we don't. Um, and I think that that's going to shape you know, how folks within societies appreciate or don't appreciate this, this, um, this source of information, how they're able to participate. Um, and also from, you know, from where I sit, focused on arms control and risk reduction and confidence building measures, you know, I think as well, if, if, if you are a government and, you, and you're going into a conversation about, you know, setting up a, a, a confidence and security building, building measures around maybe monitoring a border or monitoring troop movements or something like this, if you don't see yourself as capable in, 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 in monitoring, if you don't have the resources, if you don't have the analytical capacity in an open source way, then maybe that may discourage you from actually um, entering into the conversation in and of itself, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I still don't think that, you know, open source will be the be verified, but it will be one of two other more formal, um, more formal approaches, right? But I think all of these, all of these issues around who participates in the space, why they're able or not able to participate, both from both from a resource and a political perspective, are important to the conversation. I'm going to put James on the spot um, because I've been on the spot on this before, walking into a room and having a legislator or a policymaker wave around some new open source material and um, you know how often you know what's the role of the intel community in terms of um, maybe understandings that um, our customers as intel analysts how they use open source yeah so that's that's i think been never a challenge. happened yeah it's never, <laughs> it's never happened to me uh, I, no but I, I think that's a challenge that goes back decades probably yeah, yeah. Uh, as long as there have been newspapers and intelligence analysts there's always been difficult conversations with customers uh, especially when you don't know what they're talking about uh, yeah i hate when that happens which which <laughs> happens more often than i'd like uh because again there's just so much stuff out there and uh, i i literally have had it where i've left cia gone to the hill by the time i get there some report has come out and uh, a member of congress is, is asking me or somebody else on my uh, briefing team about it, and we're usually looking at each other, going like, well, "What are they talking about?" Um, uh, but I mean, the reality is, policymakers get their information, uh, you know, from a lot of different sources, uh, and we do compete. Uh, the intelligence community, com intelligence community, competes with uh, open source providers of information, uh, and a lot of times, sometimes uh, those open sources are better. You know, they might, uh, in a lot, as you know, we're constrained a lot in the things that we can say and the way that we can say them. Oftentimes we're constrained in the time that it takes us to say something. Uh, we're trying to get better at that, but it, and we've always been trying to get better at it. So policymakers often get their information from other sources. And uh, for, uh, fortunately, I think that we are getting better at also uh, looking at those same sources mm -hmm. and trying to understand what they're getting uh, and trying to not duplicate what they're getting from those other sources. So just like we were talking earlier about collection, you know, shifting collection assets away from stuff that we can get from open sources, I try really hard not to do the things that the Washington Post and the New York Times can do. Uh, so I'm trying to provide uh, assessments and analysis that, you, that policymakers can't get 
in the open sources. And part of that is the, uh, the, cl the classified information that I have access to that's different than what uh, other people can. And part of it's the, the trade craft that we were talking about before uh, and kind of the synergy of putting everything together and understanding. But it's, it's uh, and we like at CIA, you know, I've been at CIA now for 22, 23 years. We are constantly talking about ways to improve how we interact with policymakers because we understand that policymakers don't have a lot of time to devote uh, to, uh, you know, to getting information and they have, uh, we're competing with other providers and we have to be maybe not necessarily better than the other providers, but we have to provide them something that they're unique. not going to get. Yeah, 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 unique and also I think um, relevant. Yeah, well, And relevant, I think yeah. some, sometimes the relevance is a little easier for the Intel community because they know what the questions are um, more directly. Yeah. It depends on sometimes. the access. Um, I guess in my own experience too, there was a lot of either validation or um, you know explaining why this might not be right. Yes, we get asked a lot to respond to. Hey, I saw this article in the New York Times. Mm -hmm. Explain to me why this is different than your assessment. Yeah, and why I should keep listening to you. Right, and which I think is a great question. Sure, and um, you know one that I didn't always welcome, if I especially <laughs> if I wasn't ready for it. Um, but it's certainly important. There's a question in here um, that. Um, Joseph Rogers poses about ethics, OSINT ethics. And I, I'm going to do a jump ball on that on what does OSINT ethics mean to, to you all? Like, is there actually, um, it says here, civil society OSINT handles sensitive information. What steps should be taken to create shared ethics for civil society OSINT practitioners? And should government or imagery providers play a part in shaping OSINT ethics? I don't know, maybe Jeffrey, you're in the best place here to yeah. kind of talk about that. What does that mean? So just like I really think that we have new tools, but things aren't really different, I, I think this is a I think this reduces to a previously solved problem. I mean we have a very rich history of discussions about behaving ethically in a variety of related fields. You know, journalists confront this problem every day. Uh, you know, how do you treat information where someone's life might be at risk. Uh, if I want to do a study uh, that involves human subjects, I have to go before a review board. So, you know, I, it's not that I don't think that there are ethical concerns, because there are always ethical concerns when you are dealing with, with sensitive information. It's just that I think culturally we have really rich answers to those things. Um, and just like we avail ourselves of traditional research methods, we can avail ourselves of, of very traditional advice about how to behave like responsible human beings. How do we make sure that, I mean, what role do you think you and your institute play in, in doing that? And, and are we doing enough? Um, you know, your one voice, like, how do we, how should we think about that more broadly as a community? Well, there are, there are, Definitely groups. The Stanley Foundation has done uh, a series of reports on these issues. Uh, you know, people go to meetings. You know, it's it's something that is in the forefront of our minds. Mm -hmm. But as a practical matter, you know, it, it rarely comes up. The, the only times it really comes up for me are when I'm I'm dealing with information that some person has put on uh, a, a social media site. And, and I might think, well, drawing attention to this information might put this person in some danger. That, that happens pretty rarely. And it, it's usually pretty obvious that you just, that it, whatever research you're doing, it's you know, not what's getting somebody killed for a footnote. But I do, I do wanna um, to highlight, and I appreciate you bringing up the Stanley Center's work because they have done some great writing on how to build kind of a framework of thinking about this, right? Because I think we can't take for granted, I think, you know, for you, Jeffrey, as, as the expert in the field on this, it's obvious and I doesn't, you know, I don't really think about that much, but for the novice, right? To know that there are frameworks for them to think about this, I think is important and socializing them to your point about having meetings and making sure that this is at the forefront of the community's conversation that when we're doing this work for the newbies in the room, this is how we think about these tension points, these pain points. I'm fortunate enough to work with a deeply talented and skilled um, a senior advisor at ABC, Melissa 
Olam, formerly known as Melissa Hannum, who was your colleague, who was a pioneer on this um, this concept of open source and um, ethics and wrote some of the early early work on trying to build those frameworks. So highly recommend you all check out her work. Um, she has some really great thoughts there in terms of how do you, you know, weigh harm and impact, right? Um, particularly when you're dealing with social media data, it's different with commercial satellite imagery data, right? There's not a person so much attached to it, right? So I just wanted to plug her work because it's very impactful on this topic. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the last question, I have a five minute warning here, even though I think we have 10 minutes. Um, keep sending questions. I don't know, it's been up there for another five minutes too, so who knows. <laughs> Little time you never tell the speakers the truth. <laughs> Disinformation. I do. <laughs> I do. I wanted to ask this question about the ideas that have been put out there about an Intel community open source center, um, and whether you think, if have any views about what it would mean to set up a whole other um, entity that would just focus on open source. And this would, of course, be James's personal views. <laughs> not a reflection of any policy of the Intel community, but what do you think of the kind of the pros and cons of that from an Intel officer perspective? So have I, you I, thought about that? I'm uh, sorry. No, I haven't. Not. So thank you. <laughs> uh, so I, are you talking about like an open source analysis? Yeah, center? yeah, like a whole center whose whole job is only to do open source analysis and collection. So. We do have elements in the IC that focus on open source uh, collection, obviously, and, and in fact, uh, uh, we've been collecting open source intelligence since World War II. Uh, and part of what they do, I guess you you would call it open source assessments because they will take, uh, you know, they can do that kind of analysis. So I, I, I'm not familiar with uh, how in depth or involved it is. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's some proposals right now um, that have gone to the Office of the Director of National Intelligence and Congress has asked um, for consideration of this. So there's this, there is an actual thing um, under consideration about setting up a whole new thing, yeah, uh, <laughs> big thing. I'll, I'll plead the fifth. Uh, I don't want to get in trouble with my bosses. <laughs> okay, I will, I, will, I will press you further, James. Um, do either of you have any ideas about that? How, Jeffrey, how would you think about having... I think it would be amazing. I mean, you know, the U.S. government has, but it used to be available to us all, a very robust translation service. I know, I miss Phibis so much. I, you know, Phibis was wonderful. And, and so given the resources that the U.S. government has to bring to bear and the professionalism, um, you know, it's funny, I, I like to be all jets and sharks with intelligence analysts because, you know, like, we're competitive. We want to be better than you. <laughs> but most of the time, however you reach your conclusions on the inside, when they show up in the press, we have pretty similar conclusions on the outside. So just the, the idea that you could have that, that professionalism and those resources uh, dedicated to growing the community that I'm a part of, I, you know, I, I, I think would be wonderful. Like, we just, we don't have enough money to translate every article. Um, you know, we, we spent, wait, I manually watch North Korean TV. Uh, that's exhausting. Uh, and, and so, <laughs> so many reasons. So I, I think, you know, the, the, the strength of using open source information it, again it's not just the information it's the fact that you have an open community peer review and so to the extent that there are more people working on the open side we get stronger because everything we're doing is openly described and people can criticize it uh, so the more critics we have the better off we are the one question I would have to an idea like that, being inside of government and understanding more and more about swim lanes and, and things like that, you know, it, it, I, I take your point, James, that, that that function already exists within the traditional government IC community, right? That we already look at open source um, uh, information and do analysis on that. My question would be kind of what would be the objective of this uh, kind of centralized uh not exclusive, but more centralized open source analysis center, you know, who would be 
uh, the players in that? Would it, you know, from the way that, you know, Jeffrey, you're talking about it, it seems like, is this like a community-based organization where, or are there traditional IC analysts that just work now at this center, right? Um, they've all kind of moved from these more traditional um, intelligence organizations into this. I think, you know, I, like all ideas, it could be great, um, but there's kind of great. further development. The details. <laughs> yeah, there's further details to ask and answer, I, I would think. I want to close maybe with a question to you, Marina, about um, just looking out at the audience. Um, these are people who work in the open source world. And how could what they do be of more use to you and the US government? Do you have any swing thoughts about how they put their work together, um, how, where they put it, how they share it, what kind of work, anything you want to say or think about here to help this crowd understand how their role could be useful to the U.S. government. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I mean, first of all, thank you so much for the question, and thank you again for, for being on this panel. Um, you know, I think we as the ABC Bureau, we try to stay as informed as possible. I mean, to James's point, everyone is, you know, pressed for time, but try to stay as informed as, as possible about you all's analysis and open source analysis in general. And I think the synergy between the types of questions that we are asking, um, keeping an awareness of that, um, the work that we are doing, and we try, and we're trying even harder now to continue to increase our profile in terms of the directions that we're going if it, as it relates to multilateral engagements, as it relates to bilateral engagements. As I said, this norm development arena um, is, is very important to us. It's, it's an emerging space for us. We're kind of taking first steps here, um, and there will be a role. I think there's potentially a role for open source to be very helpful in that. But just continuing to keep the lines of communication open in terms of what our priorities are, whether it's in the nuclear space, the camera, the bio space, um, as we continue to stay aware of, of what you all are doing on the outside um, and how you're incorporating all of these different data types. Um, you know, we have a wonderful uh, V fund, verification fund that we look for new ideas, applying for that, right, as we put out calls for research proposals or different technical um, analysis, engage with us, you know, we work with a lot of NGOs and academic communities, so we're very open to ideas um, and feedback, so just continuing to keep that line of communication open, I think would be a, a natural first yeah. step for this relationship. So what I'm hearing from you is, is really is to focus on whatever you do thinking about the relevance of it to the in terms makers. of what the policymakers are worried about, what exactly. they're thinking about, and using their networks and contacts and looking, mm -hmm. and not just writing about what they're interested Absolutely. in. Absolutely. Just one, I think, one of the differences between you know the Intel community, we don't, we don't always get to write about what we're interested in. No. We have to have a customer and an, an idea of who's asking that question. Is there anything, James, for your, from your perspective about what people in this audience could do to um, to help the Intel community be better? Uh, well, I mean, checking our assessments, uh, publishing things that make us go back and look at what, we're, uh, what we've published. Uh, as you mentioned before, uh, since the Iraq War in particular, we focused on increasing our trade craft, and part of that is going back and challenging our assessments. Did we really get that right? Are we right about our current assessment? Uh, and a lot of times, we will look at open source publications to check our assessments and, and we'll look at the information that's out there and say, hey, wait a minute, how does that jive with what we've already published? Uh, so, you know, it's basically keeping us on our toes and there's nothing wrong with that. Oh, that's um, great. Know, yeah, so it, it makes us better at our job. Yeah. Or, you know, we all get fired and somebody better comes in. <laughs> well, I think that concludes our segment um, today. I just want to thank everybody for hanging in there until five o'clock. I know it's the end of the day, it's after lunch, it's three, three o'clock on, so people are a little sleepy, but thanks for all the great questions. And um, we're now gonna have a short 15 minute break for the next session, convenes at 5.15 in Regency A. For the next session, a keynote conversation on the future of arms control. And with that, I just wanna thank the three of you um, for having a great conversation about this important topic and, um, and I wish everybody well. Thank you so much.